Lecture 8. Natural, Carnal, and Spiritual Men. 1 Corinthians 2 14, 3 8. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk, and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying, and strife, and divisions, are ye not carnal, and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase, the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. 2.14-3.8 In this passage we have three men brought before us, the natural, the carnal, and the spiritual. What are we to understand by these expressions? We often say there are only two classes of people in the world, those who are regenerated and those who are not, or, to put it in another way, those who are saved and those who are lost, and of course that distinction stands. But here the apostle divides mankind into three classes, the natural, the carnal, and the spiritual. Who is the natural man? We read in verse 14 of chapter 2, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. The natural man is the man who has simply been born according to nature. Our Lord Jesus says in John 3, That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That is the natural man. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. That is the genesis of the spiritual man. But the word translated natural does not merely mean of the flesh. The word really means psychical. In 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 23 the Apostle Paul says, And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He shows that man is tripartite. The spirit, the highest part of the man, that which differentiates him from the lower creation, is that to which God speaks. We read, What man no man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? It is the spirit that gives man intelligence above the brute. By the spirit man reasons, is able to weigh evidence, by the spirit he is able to listen to the voice of God. On the other hand, the second part of man is called the soul. The psyche, and this word. Natural is an adjective formed from that word. Psychical. The psychical man, or the sulual man, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. When God created man, somebody has well said, he was like a three-story house, the lower story, the body, the second story, the soul, the seat of his natural instincts and emotions, and the third story, the spirit, the highest part of man by which he could look up to God. But when man sinned, there was a moral earthquake, and the top story fell down into the basement, and that leaves him a psychical man, it leaves the soul in the preeminent place instead of the spirit. When you remember that the soul is the seat of man's emotional nature, you will realize that the natural man is a creature led not by conscience, not by an enlightened spirit, but by following the desires of his own heart as a soulish man because he follows his own affections and desires. He is a creature of emotions, and that is why it is so easy to say that every sin appeals in some way to the emotions of the natural heart. At base all sin is selfish, we sin because we think we shall find a measure of satisfaction in that sin. Sin is always selfish, and the psychical man is a selfish being, he is a self-centered person, for after all, the soul is the self. The natural man, therefore, is the man who lives the self-life, the man whose spirit has never been quickened into newness of life, it is still down there a captive in the basement, if you will. You can see at once where that applies to you. What is your motive in life? Are you living to glorify God or are you living to enjoy yourself? Are you seeking your own desires or are you seeking, seeking to please the Lord Jesus Christ? As every saved person looks back to the old life, he can say, 
I lived for myself, for myself alone. For myself and none beside. Just as if Jesus had never lived. And as if he had never died. That is the psychical man. He may be outwardly a very good man, a very gracious man, a very courteous man, a very kind man, as long as he can have his own way. He lives for himself and finds a certain satisfaction even in doing good. He learns as he goes through life that honesty is the best policy, that he is happier if he is honest, and therefore many an unregenerate man is a model of integrity. He gets a degree of happiness out of meeting the needs of other people, he may be a very kind man, and there is a glow of warmth in his heart when he hands something to a needy person and that person responds, God bless you, sir, you don't know how much good you are doing. There may be all that and yet no thought of living for God, no thought of glorifying the Lord Jesus Christ. Some natural men descend into things groveling and debasing, their appetites lead them into licentiousness and inebriety, but other natural men take what has been called the clean side of the broad way, the higher way of the natural man, but it still is the way that leads to destruction. As you walk down that broad way you find all classes and conditions of people, some openly immoral, some vicious, some abominably unclean, others eminently respectable, looked upon with admiration, admiration by their fellows, some of them very religious and finding a certain amount of satisfaction as they wend their way to the great cathedral or little chapel, as the case may be, as they sit in a Christian, Jewish, or some other service, and as the meeting goes on they find satisfaction in feeling that they are doing the right thing. They are affected by the service, they love the music, if the preacher happens to be eloquent and appealing, they enjoy listening to him, and sometimes even though he is not eloquent, if he is earnest they like to listen to him. When Charles Spurgeon was at the height of his fame as one of the greatest preachers of the gospel, many an unbeliever thronged to hear him, many a man who rejected Christianity delighted to listen to his sermons. On one occasion as a man, well known as an infidel, was returning from Spurgeon's meeting, he met a friend who said, where have you been today? I have been to hear the great preacher, Charles Spurgeon, he said. You surprise me, said his friend, you do not believe a word he says. No, no, I do not, but he does, you know, and I get a certain amount of satisfaction in listening to a man preach as though he really believed what he was preaching. Even a natural man can appreciate that, for he may set a certain value upon earnestness and intensity. It is very possible that one may be outwardly good, his life may be a very righteous one, he may be a man of integrity in business, be very kind and benevolent, and have a certain amount of religious feeling, and yet be a natural man. What is needed to bring a man out of that state into that of a Christian? There must be a new nature, a renewing of the mind, he must be born of God. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, John 3 verse 3. This natural man at his best with all his amiability and respectability cannot enter into, nor understand, divine things. Talk to him of the wondrous truths of the word of God and he will look at you in amazement and will say, I do not see the importance of these things. Tell him that God became man for our redemption, that he was born of a virgin, and the man smiles tolerantly and says, if you get any comfort in believing that, all right, but as far as I am concerned it involves a biological miracle which I cannot accept. Tell him that Christ died for our sins upon Calvary's cross and that it was there he shed his blood for our redemption, and he will smile again and say, rather an old-fashioned idea, that idea of blood atonement. I notice in my studies it is rather a large place in all the ancient religions, but of course I do not see it at all. If our, go our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 3. Talk to him of the physical resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, and again he says, of course it does not make very much difference whether his body rose, that is a small thing. His principles have been resurrected after being rejected by the men of his day, and they abide, and if we follow the rules he laid down everything will be all right. It is only as the Spirit of God lays hold of him and gives him to see his lost condition that the gospel appeals to this man. Believing it he ceases to be a natural man, he is no longer to be placed in that category. He may be a babe in Christ, but he is a Christian. However, when you turn to consider Christians, you find two classes suggested in these words of the Apostle Paul. He uses these words in verse 15, he that is spiritual, and then in the first verse of chapter 3 he says, I could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal. Let us look at the word. Carnal. Literally it means fleshly, it is an adjective formed from the Greek word for flesh. The term. 
Flesh as used doctrinally in Scripture does not refer to human flesh, but rather to the nature which we have received from Adam, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. Now a carnal man, strange as it may seem, is a fleshly believer. There are many such persons. The carnal man has been regenerated, he has received a new nature, his spirit has been quickened into newness of life, and that spirit that fell into the basement is being elevated into its proper place by divine po power, but the man finds he is still under the power of that old carnal fleshly nature in a large measure. Many a Christian's life is made up of mingled victories and defeats. As he walks with God, as he takes the place of lowliness and humiliation before God, as he feeds upon the Word, as he breathes the atmosphere of prayer, his spiritual life is developed and he grows in grace and in the knowledge of God. But if this believer is slothful in availing himself of the means of grace, he may find that even after being saved for some years he is still far from being the kind of a Christian that it is the desire of the Lord that he should be. What is a carnal believer, a fleshly believer? It is best to find out from Scripture. In verse 3 we read, For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying, and strife, and divisions, or factions, are ye not carnal, and walk as men? Here is a Christian, one who has really trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, but as you get intimately acquainted with him, you find he is a very selfish person. He is delightful to get along with as long as he can have his own way. As long as he can run everything to suit himself he is perfectly happy and agreeable, but cross him in the least degree, bring something before him that is contrary to his own desires, and at once there is a stirring of the flesh within him and he is manifested as a carnal man because there is strife. Think of the Lord Jesus Christ. They could treat him as they would, but he was always the meek and lowly one, they could not rouse his temper by ill treatment and yet he had a temper. A spiritual Christian is not one who has no temper. Just as that knife of yours would amount to very little if not properly tempered so the Christian amounts to nothing if he is not properly tempered. We read of our Lord Jesus Christ being angry. He was in a synagogue on a Sabbath day and there was a poor woman there bowed with disease, and his enemies were watching him to see whether he would heal her on the Sabbath. He asked the question, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days? Mark 3 verse 4, But they would not answer him, and we read, He looked round about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, via 5. What made him angry? It was their hypocrisy. Hypocrisy always stirred the indignation of the Lord Jesus Christ. They could heap every indignity upon him they desired, he desired, that never stirred him to anger, but let them heap indignities upon one of the least of his children and that stirred him to the very depth of his being. When Saul of Tarsus was persecuting the Christians, Christ Jesus spoke to him and said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Acts 9 verse 4 He never talked in that way to people when they ill-treated him on earth, but when they ill-treat his own while he is in glory, he feels it keenly. When you find a Christian quick to resent what you do to him but not at all quick to resent what is done to others, you may be sure he is still carnal. Then there is envying. A person who envies another manifests the marks of carnality. We are members of one body. If that is really so, if I am a member of one body with every other Christian, I ought to be just as delighted when my brethren are honored as though it were I, and I ought to be as deeply concerned when my brethren are distressed and in trouble as if I were in their place. Scripture says, If one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it, 1 Corinthians 12 verse 26. And we are exhorted to rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep, Romans 12 verse 15. How different it often is. I can do something reasonably well, but when somebody else is preferred be before me, I cannot appreciate what they do. I think I can preach a little bit, but somebody else is enjoyed more than I am, and instead of saying, thank God for the way he is using his servant, I sit in a corner and think, what is it that makes the people so interested? I don't see anything in that kind of preaching. When I do this, I am carnal. You can apply that to everything else. If you cannot enjoy having somebody else preferred before you, you are carnal. Then there are the faction makers, the division makers, those who try to bring in strife among the people of God. Here at Corinth they were divided into little cliques and were saying, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, and everyone had his favorite. Paul says, that is just carnality. When you go on like that, you are acting like little babes. 
I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. If Christians could realize that when they compare one with another, say unkind things about some and laud others to the skies, it is just baby talk, they would be ashamed of it. Paul is telling us that it only shows carnality. It is not anything to be proud of, it is something that may well cause one to bow the head in shame. Paul says, Here you are in Corinth, Corinth, you have such wonderful attainments and are so proud because you come behind in no gift, and yet you are just babies, so that I cannot unfold to you the things that I would like to. I have had to feed you with milk, and even now you are not able to be fed with meat. You are still big babies. Paul was very faithful. The Corinthians gloried in men and they gloried in great swelling words, and some, I suppose, listened to Paul and said, we don't see anything in his preaching, we learned that years ago. Why doesn't he go into the deeper things? A brother was a candidate for the pastorate of a church and he preached for the congregation on the text, Thou shalt not steal. The congregation thought it was great, and the pulpit committee met after the service to decide whether to give him a call. Finally one of the brethren spoke up and said, I don't believe in calling any man on one sermon. That was a fine sermon he preached, but I think we should ask this brother to come back again before we call him. So they decided to ask him to come back the next Sunday. He did and he used the same text, Thou shalt not steal, and preached the same identical sermon. At the close the committee met again and said, He must have forgotten that he preached that sermon last Sunday, we had better ask him back again. So the next Sunday he got up in the pulpit and said, You will find my sermon in the twentieth chapter of Exodus, Thou shalt not steal. Before he could go on, a member of the pulpit committee got up and said, You are forgetting that you preached that sermon here twice already, we want to hear, hear you in something else. The preacher replied, I am going to preach on that text every time I come to this church until you learn to keep away from Widow Jones's hencoop of a night. So Paul says, I cannot unfold the great things to you, you are still little babes, you are not developed yet, you are just carnal. But now he says, the spiritual are a different class. Who are the spiritual? Those who walk in a spiritual way, those who are guided by the Spirit of God. The highest part of the man is now in ascendancy. Self does not predominate in this man, he lives to glorify Christ and walks on a higher plane than the carnal man. He that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. What does he mean by this? The word translated judgeth is the same as in the fourteenth verse, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned, emphasis added. He that is spiritual discerneth all things, yet he himself is discerned of no man. He is able to see the difference between what is of God and what is of man, what is of the flesh and what is of the spirit, what is of the new and what is of the old nature. The spiritual man discerns all things, but he himself is discerned of no man. Other men cannot understand him if they are not spiritual. They say, he is a queer kind of a man, he does not seem to be actuated by the motives of other men, he is not dominated by the principles that dominate other men. Sometimes they even say as in Isaiah's day, the spiritual man is mad, he is not normal. Of course not, according to the present order, because he is controlled by a higher power. One of those old New England philosophers wrote, if I do not seem to keep step with others, it is because I am listening to a different drumbeat. And if a man of God does not seem to keep step with the carnal and the worldly and the Christless, it is because his ear is attuned to heaven and he is getting his instructions from above. I remember reading, about forty years ago, a little poem that seems to me to bring out very preciously what should characterize the spiritual man. There is no glory halo around his devoted head. No luster marks the sacred path in which his footsteps tread. But holiness is graven upon his thoughtful brow. And all his steps are ordered in the light of heaven e'en now. He often is peculiar and oft misunderstood and yet his power is felt by both the evil and the good. And he doth live in touch with heaven a life of faith and prayer. His hope, his confidence, his joy, his all are centered there. Would you like to be a spiritual man, a spiritual woman? If you would, there is a price to pay. You must surrender your own will, you must yield yourself unreservedly to the control of the indwelling Holy Spirit of God. 
And that means the end of all human ambitions, that means that it makes no difference henceforth what men may think or say, you have only one to please, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a great deal of talk about surrender, about spirituality, on the part of Christians who manifest by their very demeanor the carnality that controls them. God give us to be controlled by Him. Let us then as believers not be occupied with man but with Christ. Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? And what are ministers? They are servants, and so God's ministers are servants of the people of God. Just imagine a family with a number of servants. Here is Chloe and Nellie and Tom and Bill, and the whole family is upset because some are saying, I am of Chloe, I am of Nellie, I am of Tom, and I am of Bill. What, the whole family divided over the servants? What absurdity! God's ministers are the servants of the people of God, let them accept the service thankfully, but never let them put the servant in the place of the master. I have planted, Apollos watered but God gave the increase. The servant has no power to cause the word to produce fruit. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. The servant is nothing, but God is everything. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. And what is that? They are both just nothing, they are two ciphers. But put Christ in front of the ciphers and then you have something worthwhile. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor.